See, that's what I'm saying. Your gift will make room for you. You don't have to force that. And that's not just in performing. It's in all the different ways that God places gifts in us. So that principle is great. But again, in the Passion Translation, like Trisha quoted from earlier, that verse in the Passion Translation says, I'm sorry, the voice version, not the Passion, the voice, says the right gift at the right time, that's different than just your gift. That's more time specific. And Chuck was doing a great job of talking about that Friday night, how the time that we're in is shifting. And if you follow him, you know that May 31st, 2008, we had a meeting down in Jersey City, and the Lord downloaded a major vision to him over a couple of hours while we were at that meeting. He's written books about it. And this Friday night, he said, I don't know what specifically the Lord's saying, but he said, the thing that started on May 31st, 2008, has ended tonight, and a new administration is moving forward from here. Yeah, I know. Like, it's like, should we clap or not? I don't know, right? That's how you, you wonder, because well, what does that mean? Well, trust in God means you just trust that he's going to show you what it means. And that it's, it's to our benefit because he's a good father, right? All right, so I'll, I'll just read the verses before and after that. This is from Proverbs 16, verse 15. I'll start with, and this is the voice version. It says, clever people go after knowledge to obtain it. Wise people attune their ears to hear it. All right, so it's two different things. I'm not just trying to... I don't have an ulterior motive to try to get wisdom. I want to hear that wisdom, and then I want to learn how to apply it to my life. And that was another word that he had recently, that, this past Thursday, that uh, it's not good enough to just hear the Lord. You have to also then know how to apply what he's telling you to do into your life. You don't want to take those words and just put them up on the shelf. And it might not be a prophetic word from a prophet. It might be something the Lord's showing you in your prayer time. Or it could be something you're reading. Or it could be different people talking to you. And you see, it's not a coincidence. There's something of the Lord behind what I'm hearing. There's a trend that I'm picking up on. And that's how we want to live our lives. Alert to the way he wants to speak to us. And then it says 16, the right gift at the right time can open up new opportunities and gain access to influential people. You should be happy about that. Influential people in the earth. What about just in our lives, just about talking to other people? The right gift at the right time can cause you to, to get through that narrow road that leads to life, right? Talked about that the last few weeks. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life. And few there are that find it. And I think it applies in our relationships with other people. Sometimes there's just a real, you have to thread a, a very small needle in order to hit the spot and try to communicate to somebody if you're telling them something that might be hard for them to hear. But you know because you love them, you, you want to tell them the hard things that they do need to hear. Well, there's lots of ways that could go wrong if you don't hear it the right way. Life is, I, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures today of how the Lord showed it to me. It was like It's like walking a tightrope. Back in, in my childhood and the cartoons, they would show an angel on one side and a devil on the other side. Remember those? You old enough for those? So that's kind of part of what the thinking is. There's always all these choices I have as I live my life and the decisions that I have to make. Which way? Who am I going to listen to? The tempter is always trying to get me to take shortcuts and cheat. And the Lord is saying, no, there's a better way. There's a better way. Wide is the road. There's plenty of ways to cheat. But narrow, follow my way. Follow my way. Do the right thing that I'm asking you to do. All right? And then it says, verse 17, the first ones to tell their story seem right until they're cross-examined by their peers, <laughs> right? So this is the uh, warning to us not to jump to conclusions when we're in conversations with people, okay? The first one, you're making your case and you haven't heard the other side of the story yet, right? So wait, don't, don't pass judgment until you dialogue. There doesn't seem to be a lot of that going on in our culture today, does there? <laughs> there seems to be a lot of yelling and screaming and canceling out of other people, and that's not the Lord. See, he, he disagreed with people, but he did it in a way where he could thread that needle and get the truth into them, even, even through that armor that they would have on of religion to protect themselves. Nope, he found a way in. And if we're his emissaries here, right, prophetic emissaries, I think a couple weeks ago I used that phrase, that's who we are. We're representing the kingdom of God in the earth, right? We're in the world, but we're not of it, and his kingdom is here if we choose to tap into it. So... 
Keep a balancing beam with you. I could be too legalistic. I could be too loose, right? There's all these ways. I could speak the truth, but I could do it harshly and not in love. I want to walk that line, Lord. I want to be listening to you for your direction in everything I do. So uh, this is the picture that I thought of from the movie The Walk, all right? And uh, it's true story of a guy named Philippe Petit. While the World Trade Towers are being built, he snuck up with his crew, shot an arrow with a wire across to the other tower, put a couple of guidelines on it miraculously and totally illegally, and then he walked out on that wire between the two World Trade Towers. Has anybody been down to Southern Manhattan? And if, if you have, you know that it's very windy down there because it's right on the harbor, right? So that alone, never mind how high up it is, I guess after a certain height, it doesn't really matter, you're gonna die if you fall either way. But, the, but you could barely see it in the background. Oh, I guess I thought you had it up there, I'm sorry. Can we put that first picture up? I'm sorry, my bad. Yeah, see it now? All the way down to that right corner, uh, yeah, left corner of the picture, that's the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge. So this guy was like way up there. <laughs> so uh, that's what I was saying. It's not just good versus evil. It's not just our flesh against our spirit. There's all these, there's all these uh, wars that are going on on a regular basis that are trying to pull us away from what God wants us to do. And, and you're walking out on that, on that tightrope. You, you don't have to show any more of those pictures. That's okay. Thank you. So uh, one of the things that Paul had to deal with, I'm just going to use his, him as an example for us today because obviously he's a great apostle and he's really somebody you could look at as one of the key apostles of the New Testament, right? We have so much of his writing now. But there was also so much theology that he gave us. And it's ironic, but one of the biggest opposing forces in Paul's life was religion. It was the people who already knew the Bible. Think that could happen to us today? Yes, it could, because there are people that don't believe that Holy Spirit is still supposed to be active and working today. And you know, that hasn't been our experience. Our experience is, no, the world hasn't changed. There's still sin in the world. And because God loves us, why would he take one of the greatest gifts that we have, take Holy Spirit away from the everyday practical things that we need? We need discernment. We need to know which way to go. We need to know how to walk that tightrope among all the different choices that are out there. So this is... His, his dilemma is, on one side of that tightrope, he's got real religious people who think they know everything the word means already, and then he has a secular culture that's even way worse than ours today, which would include a lot of those Greek philosophies, you know, like all the different things you read about, Stoicism and Epicureans, that all had a meaning of really just fake, fake gods. And they, they had idols everywhere, and you know, if you read the book of uh, Ephesians, there's there's temples to the goddess Diana. And in the midst of all this comes this born-again believer named Paul who knows the Jewish law but also has this amazing revelation of the kingdom of God now available to all of us in the earth. That he uses resurrection of Jesus Christ as the main reason we should pay attention. Isn't that amazing? You know, as Christians we focus a lot on the cross and, and the resurrection is almost secondary. But really, the cross without the resurrection wouldn't mean much, would it? It's only the fact that he rose again, he defeated death. He did die for us. Yes, thank you, Lord, that he did. He was willing to take the sin and the pain. But the resurrection is what Paul was talking about. That's the good news. You don't have to worship these idols anymore. You all know what I'm talking about, right? So what I said a, well, a couple months ago is one of the things that you want the Lord to do in your life is give you a vision for who you're supposed to be. We sang it today, right? I know who I am. I know who God says I am, and I'm walking in power, and I work in miracles. I live a life of favor because I know who I am. How many feel like you do? You know who you are. You have a clear vision of the purpose that God has you here, and you're on a mission. You feel it's okay to say I'm not, I don't really feel that way, because we want to pray that God will do that for you. Because when you wake up in the morning with a mission, you're excited to get up and do your thing. I'm looking down here, and I recognize Terry even behind her mask, and she's a counselor, right? Boy, you talk about a mission and being excited about your job to know that you're going to go in your office and you're going to talk to people today, and God's going to use you to help them 
make those crooked ways in their life straight. That's an awesome mission to be on. But how many know you couldn't do that, John? You can raise your hand. <laughs> right? So it's not for everybody, is it? But for the people who are called to do it, amazing. I get to know that my job is paying my bills, but I'm also working for the kingdom within my job. So I want to be mission-minded, and I want to be driven by the vision that the Lord gives me. But as Chuck would, would be ready to say quickly, don't get stuck in the old vision. Don't get stuck in yesterday's manna. It's a really easy trap, and it was one of the main opposing forces that Paul had to deal with was the Jewish people knew the Bible well, but they couldn't understand that God is a God in time. He's not, he's not, he's, he's interrupting our time. I, I don't want to say this the wrong way. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, but he's constantly giving us updates of how we should behave. All right? Doesn't mean the word is changing, but our application, how we use the word, we have to be alert to that. Okay? You with me? Because when we say religious spirit, that doesn't always have a good connotation, does it? I have a relationship with the Lord, but what does a religious spirit indicate to you? I can tell you my answer because I have the mic. It's like people who are very rigid and somewhat judgmental and not open-minded. That's religion. It, it tries to keep God in a box, and yet he's saying, no, wait. If you ever read the book of Job, you know, it's like, you're going to give me advice? Where were you when I created the universe? <laughs> right? So... Take me out of that box and allow me through my spirit in you to show new strategies, to show you as things are changing in the culture, the word doesn't change, but how we apply it changes, right? And Paul was just so good at this because it was so authentic. He had an experience on the road to Damascus, and then in other places he talks about being caught up into the third heaven and things that he saw that he couldn't even put into words. So why would we be any different? Why wouldn't the Lord want to use us as his emissaries? He wouldn't say you're an ambassador for the kingdom, but not give you credentials. Right. And the credentials is the word of God. How well do you know the word of God? How well in your spirit does the word pop up when you're confronted with a situation? Right. Well, when you're studying to show yourself approved and you're filling your tank up with the word and worship music, and you're not full of all non-redemptive stuff that could even be destructive, well, that becomes a weapon. That word inside you is alive and powerful. And Holy Spirit will direct you how to use that word, right? So uh, the ironic thing about this movie, if you haven't seen it, I'd recommend it. The Walk. While he's out on the wire, there's cops on both sides. So he walks across, and the cops are ready to arrest him. Now, look, would you have been happy if you walked across the wire between the two towers and made it? <laughs> yeah. He turns around and starts walking back the other way. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm just going to have, like, heart palpitations watching this scene. Because he's up above Manhattan. And it's windy. And, like, he's walking with this pole. He gets to the middle of the wire. And he lays down on the wire. I, I just can't believe it. Do you have that picture? Do you have that one up there? It's like in the middle of the day. He just, oh, actually, it was the morning that day. He just lays down with the pole across. Now, listen, getting down would have been hard enough, right? You're on a wire. I don't know how high. It doesn't matter. He's going to die if he falls, right? How the heck do you get up? <laughs> he did it. It's, it's a factual story. All the people were gathering. You can barely see him on the picture there. But they're like, oh, my God, that's a guy walking up there. Unbelievable. And he got this standing ovation. But why, do, why am I talking about it is because... You know, this is, this is a beautiful picture of prayer and what a very present help God is in time of trouble. When you find yourself in those difficult situations, even if you're on that high wire and you're not sure what to do, you just say, hey, can, I need a break. I, you know, I, I'll be right back. i got to go use the men's room. Hey, there's a lot of ways you could use the men's room, right? You can make that stall into a little prayer closet and say, help! Right? I don't know what to do, Lord. This conversation isn't going the way I expected it to. And I don't want to speak out of my flesh. I want the Spirit of God to be leading me in what, in what I say and do. And, and it can feel like you're up on a high wire sometimes, the way God is leading. But look, it's the right word at the right time. That's the power. And, and when we have this amazing relationship with God, when we love Him and we say, Lord, I don't want to do it my way. I don't want to speak into my flesh. I don't want to strengthen my, my earthly, carnal nature. 
that hasn't fully died yet. I want to I want to feed the spirit that's inside of me to make this book come alive and make the truths of it come alive. And I wouldn't talk about it if I wasn't going to give you an example. So the example would be, uh, we're just going to stay now in the book of Acts, chapter 17. Uh, amazing, uh, amazing picture that the Lord gives us of this exact thing, of somebody who's so tenacious, this man Paul is so tenacious, no matter how much opposition he faces, he still faces it and gives the truth of the word of God, and it literally changed the world. It's amazing that, that this guy, there wasn't much to look at apparently because that's referred to in, in other parts of the New Testament. And, you know, like when he wrote to the Corinthians, he kind of alludes to the fact that you don't think I look like much or, or I'm such a great talker, but I came in power, <laughs> right? I came in a demonstration of the power of God so that the boasting would be in him and not in our credentials, and not in the things that we in the natural can bring. He'll use what you have in the natural, but it's for his glory, right? So this is pretty interesting to me. In verse 1 of Acts 17, it says, Paul and Silas traveled through Amphip mm, Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica. So that's all Greek-sounding words, right? You say, it's Greek to me. Well, it really was. They were in Greece. And, you know, you can look it up today on the maps, all these towns are still on the map. The, the names haven't changed. And it's just a big circle. Uh, it's actually like an arc from where he was in Jerusalem. It crosses over and the arc moves through these cities. He went first to Amphipolis, then to Apollonia, and then he comes to Thessalonica, and there was a Jewish synagogue there. Now what, if we said the goal is to be mission-minded and vision-driven, what is Paul's mission? Anybody? A little louder. I'm going to say evangelism, all right? Can we, can we use that? Conversion. He wants people to convert from not knowing God to knowing God and making him Lord and Savior. So you could say he was apostolic in his, in his approach, but he was also evangelistic. He was birthing churches wherever he went because several times it'll say that once the church got established in an area, he'd raise up elders and leaders and then he'd move on to the next town. And later he'd come back and check on them. This is Philippi, Ephesus, all these different cities. This guy had a lot of energy, didn't he? Yeah. But he also had a lot of willingness to confront people with the love of God, but it was the truth of God that they didn't necessarily want to hear. Because if you're going into the Jewish synagogue, you're going to face a bit of a snake pit of opposition, aren't you? Yeah. Because they think you're telling them that everything they believe in is no longer valid. It's not what he was saying, is it? Saying, no, Jesus came and fulfilled everything that you believe in. He's the one you've been waiting for. He just doesn't look like the one you expected. But you have to be open-minded enough. The right gift at the right time will, will be able to speak it into the hearts of hardened people and say, you know what? I think you're right. I never looked at it that way. So don't be afraid. Now, are we all called to be evangelists as our primary gift? No. I get that. We're not all called to be prophets. We're not all called as our primary gift, but we're all called to work in all of those. Uh, it's the right word. The gifts of the Spirit, but we are still to witness. We are still to ask God, covet the gifts of the Spirit. I want to prophesy, Lord. I want to hear your voice more clearly. You might not have the title, but that's okay. You are still prophetic in the way you live your life because you're not closing him off. So we're going to see there's a little bit of a riot. Verse 3, it says... In interpreting and explaining that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead and that Jesus that I'm announcing to you now is the Messiah this was the mission he was going in to tell the Jews that the God that they've been waiting for the Messiah Isaiah 53 the suffering servant has come Psalm 22 they knew these they knew these well it's he came and he's here, and he's still alive. Even though he was crucified, he rose again. And, he, and that Messiah is still alive. How would you like that to be, your pitch, if you were in sales? <laughs> Sounds like a little bit of a tough sale, doesn't it? But because Holy Spirit is present in the earth, and because Paul has the right word at the right time, he knows how to tell these people because he himself was so staunchly against the Christians until the road to Damascus. And all of a sudden, it all made sense. And it took him a while. It says there was a long gap in, in the time from that road of Damascus till he actually went 
And Barnabas came and found him and said, let's get on the road and let's just take this message to the world. Pretty incredible how brave this man is to face confrontation. I'm really, I'm just going to say, I'm sorry that the church has lost some of that. The church has kind of settled into a comfortable position of, well, I'm saved and I'm going to go to heaven someday when I die because God won't, won't take away my salvation. But what about the present day ministry of Holy Spirit in our lives? We really have to activate that. We have to go for it. We can't just expect it to happen. We've got to partner with God and say, I want to have a clearer vision of what you want me to do. I want a clearer definition of what my mission is. When Trisha and I came out here from where we were living in Essex County in 1999, we had a vague picture of what it was going to look like, but we needed more definition as time went on to, to plant a church and, and to see the hand of the Lord moving and when we had to shift. Because what got you to a Bible study is very different to what gets you to a, a thriving body of believers. There's a lot of different skills that are required, but it never, uh, I, I don't want to say, never is a tough word, but when you have a clear understanding that God told you to do something, even in the tough times, you're going to push through. And, you know, Paul had some tough times. If you, if you study his life, there are times that it says, you know, he was in deep despair. We might call that depression today, right? And yet, the vision of the Lord being so strong in his mind, he knew what he was supposed to do. And I'm just trying to encourage you, you don't have to have Paul's mission, but you better, Reyes, better find out what the mission that God has for Reyes. And he better be excited in the morning when he wakes up about that vision. And I don't meet a lot of people that are very excited to get up in the morning. They have to go work and they have to collect a paycheck and pay their bills. But look, it can change. You know, the, the Lord can open up doors. The right gift at the right time will bring you before influential people. It's so wonderful. A lot of our Christian friends are, are consulting to corporations. And they might not call it prophetic in the marketplace, but that's what it is. The Lord has given them prophetic insight on how to solve problems in secular areas. So that's what Paul is saying when he goes to the synagogue. The Jesus that I'm announcing to you is the Messiah. And then uh, verse 4 says, some of them were persuaded. Which means that there was an anointing on what Paul was saying, right? Because there was a yoke on their lives. This firebrand comes in. He has a clear vision and a mission, and he knows how to speak it. He's the right gift at the right time for those people, and some of those people in the synagogue were persuaded that Paul was right. Now what happens is there's entrenched ruling authorities in different regions, right? You know that from uh, Ephesians chapter 6, right? Uh, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. It's, it's, some, it's some pretty dangerous stuff that we're fighting against. And Paul was walking into a very religious culture in this synagogue, and yet some of the people were persuaded. It was like the light went on. Well, what do you think the people that were entrenched in power would think about that? Going to be happy about it? Why not? Because their position is now going to be diminished. Where else do we know that from in the Bible? The life of Jesus. The, the power structures felt threatened by Jesus. So this is a tough part about Christianity because if you're going to bring the truth into difficult situations, you're going to face some persecution, aren't you? And that's not easy to deal with that. But when you know it's the Lord, you're willing to do it because when that person gets saved and they get set free and they tell you their marriage was saved or they tell you they didn't commit suicide because they got saved or that drug addiction was broken off their life, all of a sudden all that contending was worth it because you saw somebody's life change. All because... God was willing to pour through the broken vessels that we are, right? There's plenty of cracks. He's the one that gets the glory. But if we're available, he'll choose to use us. Ah, oh, didn't like it. Verse 4, some of them were, were persuaded, and they threw their lots in with Paul and Silas. But the Jews were righteously indignant. How many know about that one? <laughs> uh, we feel justified sometimes in our anger, but let's just be careful. That's all I'm saying. The, they had the answer right in front of them. Jesus was in the room, and Martha was saying, tell Mary to come in and do the dishes. Like, Sorry, no. God is in your living room. You don't, you don't pull people away. You go hear what he has to say. The dishes can wait. Right? And, and unfortunately, that's what religion does. It kind of cements inside people's hearts. Now there's only one way to do things. 
And, and it's tricky, right? Because I'm not saying water down the word. I'm not saying change the meaning of the word, but the application is where we really need that power of that, of that right gift of the prophetic. So there was opposition. Verse 5, the Jews were righteously indignant, and they took some villainous men. Oh, you like that word? Some villainous men from the marketplace. These are the guys that didn't get work that day, and they were looking for something to do, and they probably weren't too happy about life. And they said, let's just draw a crowd, and they threw the city of Thessalonica into an uproar. Now, you know that Paul wrote two letters to the church in Thessalonica, right? First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. So clearly, this wasn't the end of the church, but boy, there was some disruption to get the thing started because some of those people were persuaded. So what happened? These people, this was the accusation. These people who are turning the world upside down are here now. How many would say, after you leave, somebody said, wow, that guy's turning the world upside down. <laughs> that should be a good testimony, right? Again, Linda, you know, she li Linda lives with us, Trisha's sister, and she's, she turned her job situation. The atmosphere where she works has changed because people have accepted the Lord, and they're praying now, and just, just happened to be where she was, but her gift made room for her. They were willing to listen. They saw a consistency in her life. Boom. Lives changed. Beautiful. Not, yeah, I'm going to get to go to heaven when I die, but while I'm here, I'm just going to suffer through. Let's not think that way. We are going to go to heaven when we die, but I'd rather be mission-minded. I'd rather be driven by a vision that the Lord has given me. All right? So look, what was the charge? They're saying, not only are they turning the world upside down, they're challenging authority. They're saying that there's another king, and his name is Jesus. So if somebody asks you where you go to church, what do you say? King of kings, <laughs> if you're here today anyway, right? Well, it's right there. Yes, there is another king. His name is Jesus. We're still saying that all these years later. But hey, the people that were in the culture are worried that if, if it sounds like it's an uprising and a revolution, then Rome is going to come in and stamp us out. So we better protect our position. Be careful. That's all I want to tell you. Just be careful. We want to live our lives for the Lord, right? We want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And when he's in it, when God is in it, there is no limit. Remember that song? Yeah. So you don't know all the different ways that things will unfold. I mean, Chuck Pierce was in, uh, in, a, in a strip mall not that long, you know, I don't remember when, maybe 15, 20 years ago. And, and they were just doing what the Lord was showing them to do. And they kept growing and growing. And, and by hearing the voice of the Lord and being connected with other prophets, God has highly favored that ministry. I think it's 45 acres of land that they have now. I think it's 250,000 square foot building. And look, we're not, we're not measured by those things, but it's a sign and a wonder that the Lord provided all of this because somebody was willing to be obedient and listen to what the Lord was, was saying to them. That's where the blessing comes. It's in our obedience, not because we follow the rules better than somebody else. It's not that contest. So what happened? Verse 10, they said, well, we better get Paul out of here. So the Christians in Thessalonica quickly sent Paul and Silas to Berea. How many know what Berea is famous for? The Bereans? Anybody? Yeah, well, okay, so that's a common name for ministries these days, right? So the Bereans were people that said, well, we'll listen to you, Paul, but we're going to make sure everything that you say is written down in the Bible somewhere. How many want to be a Berean? Yes. 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 Everything we do should be checked against the word. If it doesn't have a grounding in the word, let's be really careful about the extensions, right? So they were sent to Berea, which wasn't too far away. And when they got there, where'd they go? To the Jewish synagogue. This is what they do. They go to the Jewish synagogue. <laughs> and when the Jews from Thessalonica, that last town, knew that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea, what do they do? They go to Berea. They're saying, oh, no. We kicked him out of our town. Don't let him stay here because this guy's a troublemaker. So there's this band of people that don't like Paul. And it's not good enough that he just left Thessalonica. Now they follow. And it says they came stirring up trouble and whipping up the crowd. So the Christians quickly sent Paul alone, just by himself, away as far as the seacoast, which was 140 miles away. <laughs> so... Kind of unlikely that they were going to follow him all the way down to Athens. 
It was really for his safety and his protection. And like, I don't know, just think it's important for us to think about how do our lives today compare to what this man was going through? You might think, well, I don't have the same call as Paul had on his life. That's true. We don't have that specific call. But are there riots being created when we start talking about the Lord? <laughs> or are we just taking kind of the safe American Christian way out? We, we can't be afraid to confront sin with the truth if we do it with love. That's why it's a tightrope. That's why it's this wire that we're walking on. Because there's plenty of ways that we could do it wrong. But if we don't keep practicing, we're not going to get very good at this, are we? So if we're just not people who like confrontation, let's just be careful that's not fear trying to creep in because we have such good news, don't we? Yeah. So why wouldn't we want to tell people about it? And, and it's not, you know, it's never kind of culturally correct. Don't talk about politics or religion. Well, then people aren't following those rules anymore, are they? It's all over the place. So if you believe this is, is the most important thing a person could do, we should be talking about it. And Paul was. And on the, in the natural, it wouldn't have looked like he was having so much success. So now he's alone, and he's in Athens. And, you know, I'm, I don't think he was worried that he was alone, but it is nice when you're with people that you can pray, right? One puts 1,000 to flight, two put 10,000 to flight. There's this leverage that happens when you're with other believers, and you've, somebody's got your back. And while he was there, verse 16, it says his spirit was stirred up as he saw the whole city simply full of idols. He argued in the synagogue with the Jews. <laughs> Sound like a familiar pattern? It's not like, well, I tried this twice and it didn't work. I better not do this anymore. No. He knows there's going to be opposition, but he loves them enough to keep going into the synagogues. And, and now he's in Athens, which is a monster city at the time, right? Full of idols. And the Jews there don't seem to have the same level of apprehension as Thessalonica and Berea and, and, and the prior places that he stopped because, well, well, we'll see as we read this, he just grieved in his spirit by the idolatry in the land. Does that apply to our lives? Please say yes. We, like, you really should be grieved about what's going on in America right now that has an antichrist feel to it, an anti-authority feel to it, an anti-patriotic feel to it. Like, okay, it's not a perfect country, I get it, but wow, have we made an amazing impact on the rest of the world. Not perfect, I get it, not perfect, but you can't throw the whole history away. I won't. You do what you want. I'm not throwing the whole history away. There's veterans probably right in this room right now who served our country. There could be police officers in here. I honor you as a police officer. I wouldn't want that job. It's a tough job. Are they all perfect? No, of course not. But no police is not a great answer, okay? Not a great answer. I got a veteran right by the back door. What a surprise. They trained you well. You're still protecting people. <laughs> oh, he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearers. I like that one. The Jews and the God-fearers. And in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. That's a good word, too. In the marketplace, every day. So on our jobs, you don't have to violate your company rules. But if somebody says, how was your weekend? Aren't you allowed to say, oh, man, I had a great time. We were in church, and I heard a great message, and I'm learning all these ways to apply the Bible to my life. And it's not easy. It's a 2,000-year-old book. You know, think you can make this current to our lives right now. If somebody's an unbeliever, like, really? I remember I had a doctor one time. He said, what are you going to do this weekend? I said, well, I'm a pastor. I'm going to be preaching a Sunday service. And he was just like kind of being nice. We didn't know each other that well. And he had the chart in his hand. And he said, oh, well, have a good weekend. What are you going to be doing? And then he went like this. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to be preaching this Sunday. And he stopped. And he looked at me and he went, what? You're going to be preaching on Sunday? And I, and, and I said, yeah. And I'm excited about it. He said, oh, my God. That must be so hard to prepare a message every week like that. I said, oh, no, I never had that problem. I just have to narrow it down what I want to say. Because his experience as, you know, his version of Christianity, he just said it was very bland. There, he didn't feel a lot of life. So they're not really expecting much. What a shame. 
The word of God is alive. It's powerful. It's got a two-edged sword, right? Like, it's breathing. But it's supposed to be breathing in us as the emissaries and ambassadors. And it was in Paul. Well, I'll tell you. People knew there was something different about this guy. And they were persuaded, too. I like that. Not just in the temple, in the marketplace. He was talking out in the marketplace. And that's a place where people really need some spiritual guidance is in the marketplace. Because there's all kinds of conflicts of interest that come up. I was on another Zoom call this week, and one of the people leading the discussion was more of a theologian and very successful guy, publisher, and everybody on the call was somebody that works someplace in finance on Wall Street, pretty much. And uh, they were all like, oh, I saw you on The Blessing. I didn't know you were a singer, you know, because there's that. Uh, video out now, the New York Blessing. They said, oh, I know that guy. And so they're like, oh, that's great that you were on there. So, you know, we have a connection. We're all Christians in Wall Street somewhere, in the finance world somewhere. And this theologian that was on said, you know, we were talking about conflicts of interest on this subject, and he said, have any of you ever faced a conflict of interest on your job? <laughs> and there's like 55 people on the call, and like almost every hand went up. And this guy was shocked. And it's not shocking at all. The world is full of all kinds of evil stuff, right? right. And mammon, wow, mammon. The love of money is the root of all evil. So you don't think there's spiritual warfare on Wall Street. What? In New York City, especially, right? The financial capital of the world. And one after another, people were talking about how they were put in, their bosses tried to put them in compromising situations, and they took a stand, and they said, no, I won't do that. That violates my conscience. I'm sorry. I'm not going along with that. Let the chips fall where they may. I'm not doing it. And none of us, got, I was one of the people that said I wouldn't do something and didn't get fired for that. And, and that was what the theologian said. He goes, wow, I'm really surprised that none of you had action taken against you. Because it wasn't a company policy what we were being asked to do. It was a suggestion made with a lot of threat behind it. So be careful that you don't back down to bullies. You know, I know who I am. I'm walking in power. Do that. Walk in power. We don't roll over, right? And Paul's such a great example. I'm going to keep going here because 18 says, what can this babbler be going on about? <laughs> so the people that don't like you will try to discredit you. And you be careful that you don't become the thing you don't like in them. If you don't like the fact that they're trying to pull you down and criticize you, you don't have to fight with the same kind of tools, right? No, take the high ground. You bring God into the situation and be a good listener and try to know as much of their side of the story as you can. And, and don't disrespect them. Say, look, I respect your opinion. It's a free country. But this is where I come down on this decision. This is what I believe. So this is an interesting part of the story in Acts 17. It says, he seems to be proclaiming these are not just philosophers, okay? There's, there's a mixed crowd here. What's he babbling on about? He seems to be proclaiming foreign divinities, declared others, since he was preaching Jesus and the Anastasis, Jesus and the resurrection, all right? This is a new thing that they were hearing. And you might wonder, well, maybe they just wanted to bring him to the other philosophers, the people who had nothing to do all day. I've heard that. The people who were at the Acropolis, not, not the Acropolis, I'm sorry, the Aeropagus, not Acropolis. They're right next to each other. Aeropagus is, is the same thing as Mars Hill in the Bible. And it's a, it's a little, mount, little granite rock near the Acropolis, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. But I'm just trying to help you see Paul did not mind opposition. <laughs> right? He's like, no, I have the right gift at the right time to come in and tell these people what I have to say. If they don't want to hear it, it's okay. Because God's behind what I'm doing. I'm mission-minded. He sent me on a mission. I have a vision of people getting saved and churches getting started and the influence of those heathen people that never knew anything about God coming to know him. Because that was another offensive thing. Anybody could come into this new church. It wasn't just smart people. It wasn't just people who could read. It wasn't just Jewish people. It was the worst of the worst sinners were all allowed in. And in spite of all that opposition, he planted church after church after church because the Spirit of God was with him. Is he with you? Yes. Say yes, please. 
got to make up for some lost time here. I haven't been able to look at much but empty seats for a long time. So it's good to see you all. So they took him up there to the Oropagus. And I'll show you a picture, I think, if we have that one. Do you have? Yeah, there you go. So the one on the top is the hill of the Oropagus. So you see those people look pretty small on Mars Hill. But then you look in the contrast of what was just right behind it. And that was the Acropolis. OK, so that's a huge set of buildings that's still standing now. They were built about 500 years before Christ, OK? four to 500 years BC. So this was monuments to idols, <laughs> right? Does Paul care? No, but because he knows he's serving a living God. He knows Jesus is the Messiah. He saw the risen Lord. Just like Peter said, we're not following some cleverly dis uh, disguised scheme. We saw the Lord, he's alive. <laughs> Whether you believe it or not, doesn't matter. He's still alive. So when I saw the picture, I'm thinking, wait, this is a lot different than I had thought about it, that they were just bringing him to talk to some philosophers. This was a court. This is where Socrates was tried hundreds of years before and given the death penalty for sedition, for, for coming against the local government. And that's potentially, that was the charge in the other cities too. He's going to start a revolution. He's starting a revival. He's saying there's a different king. But it's not somebody who's going to sit on a throne. It's the throne of your heart. Yeah. They couldn't understand it. It was not what they were expected. They wanted another King David to come in with a sword. And Jesus said, no, this word is alive and powerful and sharper than the two-edged sword. You don't need force in the natural to kill people. You just need to get their hearts surrendered to Jesus. Everything else will fall in line and change after that. Isn't that awesome? He's so much more powerful than any weapon that could be formed against us. So this is where I'm being brought now, if I'm Paul. I'm going up to the top of this big granite rock, and in the background is this monster of this Acropolis of all these huge buildings that were dedicated to idols. And, and they say, kind of sarcastically in verse 19, they take him to the Oropagus, Mars Hill, and they say, are we too able to know? So there's almost some sarcasm in there about this. They said, what this new teaching really is that you're talking about? And they were mocking him, is what most scholars would tell you. It's like, oh, yeah, we get a lot of you guys. You're talking revolution, but we don't, we don't like what you're saying. And if you are going to try to start a revolution here in Athens, we're going to take care of you real quickly. He's basically on trial. And other scholars believe that it probably took longer than what we read in the Bible. There was probably more of a procedure involved. But what the Holy Spirit gives us in Acts is what God wants us to know about what happened in that transaction. And, and in my life, I feel like I've been through a lot of these kind of situations where I walk into a situation and I don't feel fully equipped to know how to handle it. So it's like the guy on the wire, you're, you're praying. You're just saying, Lord, I need that very present help right now. I need you to talk to me and tell me what to say. I want to open my mouth and I want you to fill it. And uh, you might see uh, Prophet Jane Hammond is some of, uh, we have videos on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page. We're in relationship with them. They're amazing people. And she said often in her life, the Lord will give her a prophetic word for somebody. And she gets up to them and says, thus saith the Lord, with no idea what's coming next. How confident would you have to be that you know God is just going to fill your mouth as you open it? I hear the Lord saying to you, boom. And it's just in that moment that they get what the Lord is saying. Now, that might sound a little odd to somebody here because we're so used to our linear thinking. The Jews did not think the way we think. They thought in circular times and season. They, they didn't have spreadsheet kind of thinking where one plus one plus five plus seven, all these formulas and linear that they said, no, we work with a dynamic God who does miracles. So we're not always going to be able to explain with our logic the ways of the Lord. His ways are above our ways. But we know if we're obedient to him, we'll be blessed. And if we disobey, we have a problem. So that's what I'm picturing, Paul, as he's on trial at the Oropagus up on Mars Hill. And there's this big looming structures in the background of all this false idol worship that's been going on. It's quite a picture of the early church confronting the demon spirits
that were ruling the world at the time. And they said, what is this new teaching that you're talking about? And then Paul stood up in the midst of them. Now again, like just think about this. Could he have known that morning that he was going to be put on trial? No. Right? And that's, I'm afraid some people, when they read the Bible, they think that some of these people had an unfair advantage that we don't have. No. They're people, just like us. But they developed a relationship. They were very intentional about developing a relationship with the Lord. And the more you try something, typically, the better you'll get at it, right? So if you're not sure if you're recognizing the voice of the Lord, keep trying. Keep pressing in. Get some teaching material. Watch people online that are anointed, and there'll be an impartation. Because God loves that. He rewards that. You're a diligent seeker. He rewards you for that. So he says, men of Athens, he stands up in the midst of them, and I believe it's a trial, not just a bunch of philosophers. I see that you're in every way an extremely religious people. <laughs> now there's no notes. He's, he's not prepared for this. He's just being thrown in front of these people. I could see you're extremely religious people, for as I was going along and looking at your objects of worship, I saw an al altar with the inscription to an unknown God, right? So this is how Holy Spirit works. It's on the fly. It's improvisational. If you're a musician, there's no sheet music. It's all by ear. You got to hear it in heaven and translate it and bring it into the earth. And, it's, and now it's your turn, Paul. And if you're having a bad day, it might not end well for you. So every day we need to be hearing from the Lord, right? Do you believe that you're the right gift at the right time? Yes. You are. Jesus is the right gift at the right time for whatever situation we're in. But you need to know that you're not supposed to do everybody's job. You're supposed to do your job. What's your mission? What's your vision? You don't have to go do somebody else's. You just have to really know yours. Then you don't have to feel guilty. And you don't have to compare yourself to other people. But here he is. It's like the show must go on. I didn't really want to be here on trial right now. But since you asked me, I'm going to start telling you the good news that I have, even for you. So you're very religious. He gives them a compliment. And you even have one to the unknown God. So what am I here to tell you? Verse 23, I'm here to tell you about what it is that you're worshiping in ignorance. I know your unknown God. And you're going to love meeting him because he wants you to know him. Huh. If he didn't say the right things, it might not have ended well. It could have been thrown in jail as it was a court. So the God of, who made the world and everything in it, the one who's Lord of heaven and earth, doesn't live, and you can picture him going in temples <laughs> and pointing at the Acropolis. He doesn't live in temples made by human hands. Hoo Meditate on that one, right? He lives inside of you. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Is yours? You should be excited about that, right? Yeah, yeah. Comes with you wherever you go. My body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. I don't have to go to a building to find God. He's in me. Yeah. Woo. He doesn't live in temples made with human hands. Nor is he looked after by human hands as though he needed something. Since he himself gives life and breath to everyone. So God isn't looking for us to give anything. Because he gave us everything. He gave us our life. He gave us breath. What he wants from us is obedience as children. And these people were used to the religious version of a relationship, which religion and relationship don't go too well, is that we better appease the gods. We better appease them. Not bring an offering voluntarily because we're so grateful because we understand the relationship. It's like, let's avoid punishment. No, that's not the God Paul is telling that, that they serve. He made from one stock every race of humans to live on the whole face of the earth, allotting them their properly ordained times and boundaries for their dwellings. That is new to these folks. Made from one stock, the whole face of the earth. That means all people in the eyes of Jesus are equal. That's a foreign concept to these people. It was all power. You were only valuable if you had power. Slavery was rampant in this culture. So the idea that God would care about a slave, foreign concept. Only the important people. No, that's not our God, is it? 
God cares about everybody the same. Priceless value. Could not put a price tag on the value of your life. That's how much he loves you. So Paul's pretty brave. He's standing up against the face of this opposition. And he's telling them that we're all equal in God's eyes. And that verse 27 says the aim was that they would search for God. And perhaps reach out for him and find him. Indeed, he's actually not far from each one of us. Isn't that good news? If you've got somebody who's struggling with something, say, God desires for you to reach out. He's not that far away. If you reach out, you'll find him. He really is a very present help in your time of trouble. Not a, a distant God that you're going to meet when you die and go to heaven. No, he's wanting to be part of your life right now. And these people in the courtroom were a little taken aback by that. Like, wow, you're talking about a, pers a personal deity. One God who made the whole thing. And they were used to all these multiple gods from Greek mythology and all the different ways that it was perverted and twisted. And then you all probably know it in verse 28. For in him we live and we move and we have our being. We exist because of him. It's in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have put it, for we are his offspring. Right? So wow. That lets you know that Paul understood the same things that they were reading and writing. He was willing to use examples that they could relate to. He didn't feel defiled by having to understand what, what was making the other people tick. Because if you want to uh, present a different way to look at life, you better have a way of understanding what they're thinking now. So he quotes one of their own poems back to them. It's a very good thing to do, isn't it? It's a way to relate to somebody. And you know, in my case, if you have a background in, in the drug culture, you remember what that was like. You remember what was appealing to you and what attracted you to that whole scene. But now there's a better way. And the fact that you're not acting like you're better than them, and you're just saying, no, really, I get it. I get what the temptations are that you're facing, but there really is, there's a better way. I used to understand exactly what you're going through, but what about this? Have you tried this? Submit yourself to a higher authority. Jesus Christ is, is the higher power. And you'll now have strength to resist those temptations that you didn't have before. Hmm. So he quotes one of their poems. Well then, if we really are God's offspring, we ought not to suppose that the divinity is like gold or silver or stone formed by human skill and ingenuity. So what, he's just quoting Genesis 1. We're, we're made in the image of God. You as people are representatives of the kingdom, not all these idols that you guys have been taught to worship. And boy, is that a profound thing to tell them because it's really good news. I don't think, I think people that are caught up in religion are exhausted half the time of trying to keep up with all the rules. And a relationship with God that's alive and living is not exhausting. It's very life-giving. It doesn't mean you're not busy and you're not doing stuff, but you're doing it out of a love motive, not out of a fear motive. You're doing it because you love him and you want to please him and, and because you feel like he's using you to touch other people's lives. So this really is good news to these folks on this panel that want to put him in jail potentially, right? Are you another one of these revolutionaries? No. I'm, I'm here to tell you that there's a God that loves you, he made you, you're made in his image, and you can trade in those idols for a living God, a resurrected King Jesus. He's not going to take over the politics, he's going to take over your heart. And that's how revival comes, one person at a time. Individual people start making different choices, and in London, the bar shut down when there was a revival, because nobody wanted to get drunk on alcohol anymore. That's a sign of a revival. Verse 30, that was just ignorance, but the time for that has passed, and God has drawn a veil over it now. Instead, he commands the whole human race everywhere to repent. Now that, that would not have been something they would have wanted to do. What does repent mean to you? It means you have to apologize because you made a mistake, and nobody likes to admit that they've made a mistake, but we probably should read a little bit more into that word repent, because it means change the way you think, change the way you make your decisions. Recognize that there's an elevation in the way you can think 
that comes out of sin and has a higher authority that has put it in place for you, a God that loves you, that isn't expecting you to, what's the right word, to abandon your own personality. He wants you to fulfill your own personality. He wants you to live to the fullness of who he created you to be. And if there's sin blocking that, you're not going to be the fullness of who he created you to be. So when your eyes are open to this new Lord that Paul's talking about, the real you gets to come out. Not the one who's being driven by sin, who's being driven by the motives of the world. And man, again, here he says it. He commands the whole human race, every human being, if you're breathing and you're alive, we're all equal in his sight. Everybody should just repent, say, God, I'm sorry I didn't know you. I was born into sin. Now I want to be born into your kingdom. I want that second birth into the kingdom of God. And I'll be ended with these two verses. It said, because he has established a day on which he intends to call the whole world into account. That could sound a little scary, right? There's a day that everybody's going to have to come before him. And, and you're going to have to bow your knee. One day every tongue will confess that you are Lord. One day every knee is going to bow. With full and proper justice by Jesus. A man who God has appointed. God has given all people his pledge of this by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. And anybody that's been doing this any length of time will tell you that that's the whole hinge point of the gospel is the resurrection. If you could disprove the resurrection, the whole thing would fall apart. People have been trying for 2,000 years. Nobody's been able to do it yet, and they're not going to do it because he's alive. The evidence that we sang about today, I am evidence that God is real, that's Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that when he left and Holy Spirit came, those people that were filled with his spirit changed the world. What about now? Yes! People that are filled with his spirit are still changing the world. And boy, the world needs some changing. It doesn't take long to look on the news to find that out. It's just chaos. And God brings order to chaos. It's a beautiful thing. He's the one who speaks to the storms and say, be still. Whatever confusion people have, he can make that crooked way straight. And I'm just going to ask you if you'd stand because I just want to pray for each one of us here today that we would get a, an understanding that, that we could be the right gift at the right time. Amen? I, I think it'd be good if we said that. I am the right gift at the right time that God can use me however he sees fit. All right, let's just ask him to do that. Lord, just fill us with that understanding. Fill us with the understanding that you're a God that's interacting with us on a daily basis that we're no different than the apostles and the people that we read about in the Bible. They were just men who believed you, who had enough faith to step out of the boat and say, I trust you, Lord. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I don't need to know how. I just know that you will. And I might make some mistakes, and I might not get it perfect, but I'm willing to try because I want to fulfill the mission that you have me here for, Lord. I want that gift that you place inside of me to make room for me and bring me before great people so that we can be people like Paul who just influences culture, not because we act better than they, not because we think we're better than they are. No, it's to help them understand the truth of how important it is to repent and turn from the sin that was driving us and turn towards a living, loving God. Amen? And when you've experienced forgiveness, you're able to extend forgiveness. So this is really the final point I'm making. It's verse 32. I guess you can see it. 32 up there? Yeah, it says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them ridiculed Paul, but others said, we will give you another hearing about this. <laughs> All right? So you see how it works? Everywhere he went, the reason they kicked him out is because it was working, and they didn't like it. So don't take the opposition, again, like you should have a multitude of counselors as you're, as you're walking through your Christian life. You don't want to get off on some weird tangent. But look, if you're getting opposition, that's not necessarily a bad sign. It means some stronghold might be getting stirred up. And that's okay, because the weapons of our warfare, what? They're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to demolish strongholds. 
So I just bless you all. One more time, could you lift your hands? I just want to speak a blessing prayer over you. Lord, I thank you for all these amazing people that I'm looking at. It's so good to see them all, all made in your image, all filled with your spirit. And if you haven't been filled with the spirit of God yet, you should be. So we'll pray for you to do that. Lord, come. Come now. Come quickly into their lives. Make yourself real to them. Make the word come alive to them. Holy Spirit, show them new things that they haven't seen before. And I just bless them to be those prophetic emissaries like the Apostle Paul was, knowing what his mission was, being willing to contend with the, the, the principalities and powers and rulers, but having authority of the good news of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Lord, I bless them as they go this week that they're going to be a force for good for the kingdom of God in this culture and that people's lives are going to shift and change because of the influence that we have on the chaotic world. Let us bring peace and that promise of truth that you give us in Jesus' name. Everybody said, good to see you all. Love you, bless you. Have an awesome day.